Welcome to Texas Boxing Scene with former WBC lightweight world champion, one of my all-time favorite fighters, Omar Figueroa. It is an honor and a privilege to have you on, Omar. I've been a big fan of yours since, I guess, 2013 was when you really came out um, in I, in that uh, Canelo versus Trout card in San Antonio. Yeah. It yes, is a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you on. Um, how's camp going? And, and tell us what you have going on. Tell us what you have going on. Well, right now we're just, you know, well, like you said, focused on camp, focused on on my upcoming fight, and you know, trying to leave the past in the past and trying to move on from here. Um, you have Adrian Broner, July twenty third. Um, obviously a big fight. Both of you guys now are in your thirties. Huge fight. The winner's right back in world title contention. Um. You know, how big is this fight for you, first of all? How, how big is this fight? Well, I mean, like you said, this is this is the perfect fight for both of us. I feel at this stage in our careers, uh, we both have plenty left in the tank. And we, we, we both showed that. We've shown that throughout our careers. And, you know, we've, we've both had issues outside the ring that have obviously impacted our in-ring performances. So... I feel like it, it really just comes down to who can who can get their stuff to, together. Obviously, you guys are both tremendous fighters. I mean, both world champions. You both have really unique skill sets. And I want to get into your style just a little bit. But first, I want to ask you. So I hadn't even heard rumors of this fight. I didn't know Bruno was coming back. I didn't know you were coming back. Talk us through how you got the news and, and were there negotiations for a while or this kind of just spring up last minute? Yeah, no, we, well, we were, we had been talking about this fight. Obviously, we've been talking about this fight since I won the title because it was Broner's title that I, that I, that I won when he vacated. So it was something that was kind of left unfinished. But, you know, as, as everyone knows, we both had issues outside the ring and, and it just finally materialized. That's, that's as simply as I can put it. It's it's a it's a fun contrast of styles, right? You're always the pressure fighter, high volume puncher, um, and he's a lot more selective, a lot more reserved. He's like, okay, I can just kind of overwhelm this guy. I can just outwork him, break him down, win rounds, or eventually stop him. Yeah, well, that's the plan. We know, we all know the the blueprint, as they like to say. We all know what happened when he fought Maidana, and I and I feel like I have a similar style to Maidana, so we're gonna try to implement that, obviously. It does, from a stylistic matchup, look like a fight that, and I said this back in 2018, um, when you guys were both really on top of your game. This is, stylistically, this fight really favors Omar Figueroa. I, I picked you then, and I'm still going to pick you now. Um, you know, you know, the fight was originally supposed to happen in 2018. Is there anything different? Would the fight have gone differently in 2018 than it would now, or, or what differences would there be between the fight now and, and four years ago? Well, I feel like I would have been a lot healthier, so... I would have been at the top of my game and I feel like at that point he was he was already on his way down you know and not even because of his boxing but what, what he had going on outside of boxing so now that that the dust has settled for both of us I feel like you know this is the perfect time this is a perfect fight this is it's just I feel like this is a perfect fight um I want it, it is, and it, it's going to be a fan friendly fight. And and I, and I want to get back into that. Your style is so unique and so fan friendly. Um, I, I spoke to Omar Juarez, who's also from the Rio Grande Valley. Um, and he uh credits you, right? All this, you know, rejuvenation, this boxing, and all these good fighters coming out of the Rio Grande Valley. He said, you know, Omar figure up. Uh, Omar Figueroa put us on the map, and then and then Brandon came along, and and he kind of opened doors for us. I want to get into the start of your career. Obviously, you have a really fan friendly, really unique style. Um, talk to us about how your dad trained you and how your dad got you involved in in boxing. Well, he he got me involved. It's a, it's a sport that he's always loved, but he got me involved mainly because when he immigrated from Mexico to the U.S., he would get bullied a lot. You know, my dad was a handsome man back in the day he, he has green eyes and and he has a mouth on him so that would get him in a lot of trouble so he he was bullied a lot for being a wetback and he was called a wetback and you know he was always getting in fights so he figured what better way for me to defend myself than to learn you know boxing plus it's something like i said it's a sport that he'd always loved and he wishes he would have he would have done boxing but uh so he's kind of living vicariously through me but 
at, at six years old, that's when he was like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to teach this kid how, how to defend himself so that he doesn't have to go through what I went through in school, basically. And, you know, not only did you learn how to box, obviously you became a world champion. Um, yes, you, you ran up a, a bunch of wins, you know, uh, mostly in, in South Texas. Um, and then 2013, major card, Canelo, Trout. Um, talk to us, uh, were there nerves building? I mean, you're fighting on a Canelo card, right? I mean, um, you're, you're fairly unknown outside of Texas and outside of, you know, hardcore boxing fans at that point. What's going on in your head? You know, I'm fighting on a Canelo card. You know, what, what's your thoughts and, and what's going on at that point? Honestly, I had so much other crap going on in my head, especially, you know, mental health issues that that finally got resolved. But given all that, I honestly don't even know what, what the hell I was thinking. I was just kind of rolling with the punches. I was just trying to be as, as most like water, like Bruce Lee says, and trying to adapt to whatever situation I was presented with. And that's that I was just trying to survive at that point. I don't I don't remember much aside from that, just, you know, putting my head down and just grinding as much as I could. And it, it didn't go on long. You stopped Abner Cotto in, in the first round. Yeah. Um you know, a star a star was born. You know, you're you, it was in San Antonio, you know, a couple hours from where you grew up. Um it was, you know, one of the most exciting things I've seen. Like, wow, who is this guy, Omar Figueroa? Um, I mean did, did, you, did your phone blow up at that point? Did, was everyone calling you, trying to get you back in the ring, trying to, you know, trying to sign you? What happened after that? Because that was a sensational, sensational performance, like a star-making performance on a huge card. Um, you know, what happened after that? Well, no, actually, all the fun had happened before that. All the fun happened in, in early, to, in January 2012 when I beat Michael Bettis because we all feel like that fight, Golden Boy, was just trying to get rid of me at that point. Uh, you know, the, the the injuries and just like I said, I had so much stuff going on outside outside of boxing that we just had a feeling that Golden Boy was trying to get rid of me. I, I was I was becoming uh, baggage that they didn't they didn't want to deal with. And and uh, so, yeah, we just we took that fight on a whim. We, we had to. My dad had been talking about Michael Bettis for, for a while and he kept you know, claiming how good he was and how he wishes I would fight him and all this stuff. And when the fight finally was offered to us, my dad was kind of hesitant because I was coming off of an injury. Uh, I was in I was in Philadelphia helping Danny Garcia get ready for Nate Campbell, I think. And I split my leg open with a rusty nail that was sticking out of the ring and I slipped out. And it was just, you know, <laughs> a series of unfortunate events that led to me having to take that fight against Michael Perez. And that's the fight that really changed my, my career. So you, that's in 2012, 2013, you get the win over Abner Cotto. Um, you get another win uh, also in the Alamo dome. And then you get your, your world title shot with Jerry Belmontes, which I said about that Broner vacated all Texas showdown, all South Texas showdown. No, no, uh, that was the, the belt I won against Arakawa Japanese guy. Okay, and it, and it was at the Alamo, at the Alamo, Dome. Not, not the Alamo Dome, the AT and T Center here in San Antonio. AT and T, okay, AT and T Center in San Antonio. Yes, sir. Um, and after that, you fight uh, Belmontes in. I, that was in yeah, two thousand. Yeah, that was my first fight back after having broken both of my hands. Yeah, right. You broke. You break both your hands. You fight Belmontes in what's probably the fight of the year. Um, he gets off to a good start. Walk us through the second half of that fight and how you rallied and, and came back and won that fight. Honestly, like I said, I, I was, you know, I was having issues with, with working out because I had both of my hands fractured. And uh, so it was, it, it was a tougher fight than it was supposed to be. But given what, what I had going on, I mean, it made sense. I, like I said, I don't remember much. I just put my head down and I try to throw as many punches and land as many punches as possible. And that's, that's usually my, my goal when I fight. And it's worked, you know, it's worked so far. Then after you get the bell, talk to me at this point, right? Like you're, you've had these mental health issues, which, you know, is a struggle. You, your promoter wants to get rid of you. And then all this time you you won a world title, you know, yep. um, talk to me about, you know, when you wake up, you realize, Hey, I'm the lightweight champion of the world. You know, does that sink in? Like my life's work. Like I'm the light. They can never take that away from me. You know, Roberto Duran, Sugar Ray they've all been lightweight champion. I'm now on that list of like, you know, talk to me about, you know, that sinking in and, and that realization reaching that goal. 
it obviously wasn't a good wasn't a a good thing for me. It it left me in a deeper hole than I was already in because you know boxing was something that that was started because of my dad. It wasn't really my dream. It was just something that I, that I kind of picked up because I had to do it. I was forced to do it for the longest time. So after having put my whole life into it, you know, it was either this or baseball or you know because I had a full ride to to Texas A and M College Station as well. So I could have gone the school route, but there's just something about boxing that that fulfills me like nothing else and so i decided to stick with it so i yeah i've heard this too now what position did you play i'm sorry what pos- baseball uh I, i've heard this uh what oh, position I was a did pitcher you play? and shortstop pitcher and shortstop yeah so but, just- but i mean the reason why i don't want to follow through with baseball is because i mean in high school i was max like five five six if anything and so I'm five six. I'm barely throwing 86, 80, 89 miles an hour as a junior. So knowing that there's a guy that's six foot five that's able to sure. do the same things as me, it kind of puts things into perspective. So I was like, yeah, I mean, I love baseball. It's my passion, my love. But, but it still doesn't fulfill me as much as boxing does. Plus, I like that boxing. You know, it's one against one. You're kind of the same weight. You're kind of the same height. So it's more fair. Sure. But pitching kind of has that one-on-one mentality too, where it's <laughs> you against the batter. Yeah. Um, so uh, at the Belmontes fight, you pick up a couple more wins. Um, Ricky Burns, probably, you know, I don't want to say he's the best fighter you fought, but, you know, the most prolific, the biggest name, um, elite level fighter, borderline Hall of Fame fighter. You beat him up pretty good in your hometown. Uh, well, I guess outside of your hometown, in, in the – you know, yeah. Rio Grande Valley um, in Hidalgo. Talk to us about that fight and, and, and how cool was that scoring that kind of win over Ricky Burns, someone of that status, you know, in your hometown? Yeah, I mean, that was an experience in itself, having the having fought at like 3 p.m. because it was on CBS or something like that. You know, this is when PBC was first starting. I was trying to gain traction and all that. So we had a 3 p.m. fight and, and it was in my hometown and my brother got to debut on that card as well. So it was special for many reasons. And then obviously getting the, the W was, was a cherry on top. Um, then you beat DeMarco, you close out, I guess that is, that's uh, 27, that's 2015. 2015. 2015. You close out 2015, you know, with the win over DeMarco, really good year. You got one to a Burns and DeMarco. Um, then comes the layoff. Um, and then 2017, it's the first boxing event back in Nassau Coliseum, which is a famous venue. Mike Tyson fought there. Um, yeah. And you destroy Robert Guerrero, three division world champ. I mean, you absolutely destroy him. And again, another barn burner of a fight where he had a couple moments, but basically you just kept knocking him down. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was, it looked like you'd, you'd never left, right? Like it looked yeah. like there was no ring rust. Talk to us about, about that fight. Well, you know, that that's me at my close to my best as possible. That's, that's as much as best as I can describe that. Um, and then, you know, the mental health issues came back around and, and it just started taking its toll. And, and, uh, well, as everyone knows, you know, started getting into trouble outside of boxing and that's when my life kind of went on a downward spiral, but you know, Robert, Robert Guerrero was a great fight. I remember that. And I, I, I love that fight. That's one of my favorite fights. I was, I was healthy enough to go in there and be able to do what, what I do best and it's just break, break someone down and just beat them up. It was, it was, I mean, that was like vintage Omar Figueroa. Like when, when my grandkids say, hey, dad, who's your favorite fight? I'm going to put that fight in. You know, there's a couple of fights. Gaddy Ward, obviously, is one of them. Your fight with, um, well, the Bamontas fight too, but really the Guerrero fight was just like, whoa. Um, that was like five stars, 10 out of 10. Um, then you score that win. You're, you're right back on top. Um, and that's, after that fight is when you're supposed to fight Broner again. Mm-hmm. You have some issues outside of the ring. He has some issues outside of the ring. Then I think you get a shoulder injury, right? Yes. Um, and then that fight is 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 curbed, and it's another year, year and a half out of the ring. Yeah. Um, what's going on at that point? I mean, is it? I I know, I know you're battling demons. Are you still in the gym? Are you staying in shape, or how are you doing at that point? Well, you know, injuries as well, and then I had I had a lot of stuff going on outside the the gym and the ring and. And yeah, that's, that's when my mental health really started to take a, you know, a pitfall, but 
I don't know. I mean, like I said, there was just so much going on. I can't really pinpoint anything. I just, I just remember, you know, trying to keep my head down as much as possible and trying to just fight through it all. Obviously, you know, with your style, you know, you throw a hundred punches around, you're constantly swimming. You're in great shape, right? I mean, it doesn't seem, at least from a spectator standpoint, that the trouble outside the ring, the party ever really got in the way of your training because you always seem to be in great shape. Did it ever kind of interfere with, with training? Or were yeah, you able to always? Of course it interfered. But when it came down to training, I mean, that always came first. So if it was, if it, if anything was going on, if I had a choice, it, you know, it always was training. I was, when I was in training or I was in camp, I didn't have an opponent or anything going on. Then it was non-training Omar. It was whatever crazy, whatever I had going on outside of, of boxing, you know, and I let that take over. But once camp starts, everything changes. And I've always been really disciplined when it came to that. It was just, I was in discipline when I was outside of that, which obviously it matters. It matters just as much. And I, I want to ask you, because this time that you're out of the ring, your brother kind of goes from highly touted prospect to superstar in that same kind of time that you're out of the ring. Are you giving him any advice? Kind of like, hey, baby, bro, don't do what I did. Stay focused. You know, what are you telling uh, Brandon at, at that particular time when you're out of the ring and his star is really rising quickly? Well, that's that's another reason why I also took such a long hiatus from from the ring because, you know, I hated that that my brother always get kept getting compared to me, and it's something that I know he hated too. So. I, I decided, you know, to give my body enough time and, and, and well, give my mental health also time to kind of equalize or, or what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of, you know, calm down a little bit because there was a lot that I, that I had going on at that point. And uh, so, yeah, it kind of worked out because it, it allowed me the chance to get my stuff together and then also, you know, let my brother make his name too without... That without being conjoined with me, you know? And he has, he, you know, um, again, like Omar Warris told me, you were the one that put Rio Grande Valley boxing on the map, but I mean, he's taken it, you know, and, and, and run yeah. with it now. And, you know, um, he got robbed in that Stephen Fulton fight. Didn't he? Yeah. And that was, that was, that was we bad. all know that. Um, but I, I asked, um, Josh Franco, the same question. Um, I, I'm going to ask you when your little brother becomes world champion. I mean, do you win it with him? I mean, what's that? Like now you got two champions in one family, right? And and your little brother now got to the top of the mountain. Yeah. What's that like as a big brother? Like describe like what kind of emotion you have when your little brother now becomes world champ. Well, I mean, it's it's surreal. You get to experience what like I've already lived that, you know, but I get to experience it from the outside. Now I now I get to look at my brother and now I get to to just just soak it all in in a different way, you know. So it's something beautiful that happened. And I'm glad that I was able to help him. And I'm glad that I was able to pave the way or, you know, whatever people want to claim. But uh, my brother worked his ass off and he deserved to win, to win the titles. And, you know, I, like, like he said, I feel he got robbed and he should still be maybe not champion, obviously, because yeah, he moved up in weight, but he shouldn't have that loss on his record. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the draw he has, I thought was more competitive than the loss. The loss, I thought he won eight, nine rounds. I And the, I was surprised they had it as close as it was. And then they kind of stole it from him. Um, but, you know, we could get into why that may be. 126 <laughs> seems like a good fit for him, right? There, mm -hmm. There's good fights for him at 126. Um, Leo Santa Cruz is back at 26. Yep. So, I mean, if they that's could make a fight that that's fight. been mentioned too. But obviously right now he has his sights set on – on his opponent, and then you know we'll focus on on whoever's next after this one. So, and I, um, you know, the Charlo brothers said they don't really like fighting on the same card. Um, Bam and and Rodriguez and Josh Michael said they both really want to fight on a big card together. Do you want to fight on a card with Brandon? You, you know, on a big card where you both you know have major fights, or is it kind of like it's too distracting? I don't, I don't. I mean, it's the same. I've always, I don't know. To me, I feel, I feel like it doesn't really matter. I don't know if it matters to my brother, but I think my brother would prefer to fight on the same card. I feel like it, it motivates us more than anything. So Brandon's back on July 9th in yes, San Antonio. That's at the Alamo Dome, place you know well. And then you're back on July 23rd. 
Um, so you guys are going to camp together. Is it easier going to camp together, keeping each other motivated, keeping each other working hard? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, normally it, my brother never really had to go to camp by himself. I've had to go to camp by myself. I was in California by myself for, for months, you know, without my family, without anyone. So again, that's another thing that, that I had a sacrifice that I had to make to make sure that my brother didn't have to. So my brother's always had my family here to help him with his camp. And there's no, there's no one better that's going to take care of us than, than our own family, you know, than our mom. Absolutely. Um, so let's get back to your career. A after the, the, the girl, when you have another layoff, you come back um, and you get the win over John Molina, highly entertaining fight, really good fight. And you win. It seems like it's a little closer than it should be. It seems like you've beat guys not to throw any shade on John Molina. Um, but you've disposed of better fighters than John Molina, easier than John Molina. Was it stylistically he was just, you know, tough? Or was that not the best version of you at that particular time? No, that, at that point, I was just, you know, swinging at thin air at that point. But I also hurt my hand in the beginning of the fight, and, and everything just went downhill from there. You got through the fight. It's a good win. Uh, you put yourself back in, in title contention at the layoffs. You come up short with uh, Ugas. And then Abel Ramos. And I want to talk to you about the Abel Ramos fight. There's a, a story, a rumor, um, that um, Joel Diaz met you at the airport with a scale and made you step on the scale. Is that is that true? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, when I when I got to camp, I was actually weighing 154 already. So you were already close to. So yeah, no, yeah. I had no, I had no problem with. I'm not. It's because I'm not a 47 pounder. The only reason I moved up in weight was because the injuries weren't letting me train to the point where I could get to 140 and do it without struggling too much because I had already been killing myself for so long trying to make 135, you know? So that's why after my, after my last fight against Estrada in, in at 135, you know, moving up to 140 was never easy because the injuries weren't letting me train the way I needed to train to, to drop the weight and all that. So we decided to just jump to 147 and kind of give my body a break. But we knew that it was going to be tougher. We knew that the guys were going to be, you know, tougher and, and heavier and stronger, but that was never something that scared me. It's just, it's just what I had to do to, to keep on fighting. It, I get paid to fight. You know, if I don't fight, I don't get paid. So I got kids to feed. Absolutely. Um, I, I actually, I don't know if you remember back in, I guess it was 2019 when, uh, you when Brandon, fought at in the valley the last time brandon fought in the valley i asked you if you could still do 140 and at that time i guess it was 2019 you said yeah 140 147 mm -hmm. can you still comfortably make or can you probably not easy but can you still make 140 if the right fight came along could you make one oh, no still? i'm fighting at 140 in this it's this not out of catch weight it's at it's at 140 well regardless i'm already yeah. weighing under 150 okay so 140 really not a problem yeah i'm actually even considering 135 so Depending on how how well I do, I make the weight at 140. Then you know 135 might be an option. I mean, it, look at look at how the 135 division is is stacking up. I mean, yeah. it's exciting. It's, it's exciting time for boxing. So 147, really? That's not that's not your that's not your division. You're fighting at welterweight. You're fighting in the wrong weight class. I mean, you can do it at a high level because of your skills, but that's not really your weight class. No, I mean, it was interesting and I, and I wish, you know, I was healthy enough to, to actually try and compete at 147, but it was just a survival strategy that, that we, that we, that we moved up to 147. So we're about a month and a half out now, um, six, seven weeks from the, from the Brona fight, <laughs> seven, and a half weeks. seven and a half weeks. Um, so you got a full camp. I mean, it's not, you got plenty of time. Um, is that in Chicago? Is that confirmed? or that, that was the rumor. Do we know that for sure? Is that still kind of being... Well, I mean, that's, I, that's as far as I've heard, too, that it's okay. in Chicago, you know, July 23rd. So I know as much as you know at this point. You'll fight him anywhere, right? You'll Regardless. fight him in the backyard. You'll fight him in Ohio. You don't care, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I know you don't look past any opponent, right? But uh, an Adrian Broner win, you know, even at this stage, Adrian Broner is still a name. It puts you right back in the picture at 140 or 147, or you said you want to go down to 135. Is there a goal? Like, okay, after I beat Broner, I know we don't look past Broner, but if I do beat him, when I beat him, I want to fight this world champion. I want to fight. Well, there's only one belt holder at 40. Yeah. Does that, you know, does that, do you stop looking ahead at, at the world champions? Well, no, I feel like I've, I've gone through so much in my career. I, 
I, there's no use in looking past, you know, what I haven't even gotten through. So first we want to make sure that we get to this fight healthy. We want to make sure that we can make 140 healthy. And then we want to make sure that we can beat them healthy. And then, you know, we want to make sure that we remain healthy after the fight. And then, and then we'll, we'll start looking at, you know, next possible opponents. If you could do 135, um, there's a knockout artist at 135 who fights on the PBC side of things, Tank mm-hmm. Davis. I mean, is that something you've ever like thought about? Like that, that would be from a fan's perspective, that would be a 10 out of 10. Like that's, I mean, is that a fight you you've considered? Well, I mean, the, the better the fight, the more exciting it is for me. So absolutely, you know, I'll, I'll take on anyone, but like I said, I just first want to make sure that I can do it healthy because right. I've been injured for the, the better part of my career. And honestly, I feel like that's also taken a toll on my mental health, having to have that extra pressure of the injuries and, and struggling with the weight because I can't work out properly because of the injuries. So I don't want to, you know, Broner's next July 23rd in Chicago and we'll go from there. Um, July 23rd, it's, it's going to be a, a sensational night. It's back on Fox. It's the first actual fight Fox, I think, will televise this year. Um, um, so, I mean, um, without giving away too much, you want to give a prediction or, or how, how's July 23rd going to go down? Honestly, I'm, I'm done making predictions. I, you know, my last fight, I know I could have done it. Had I been healthy, I would have finished him in the first round and I'm sure Abel knows it, but I'm just, I just want to get there healthy and I want, I want to, I want to, you know, make it through the fight without any inconveniences and once we're there then i just want to be able to to be the the best version of myself and that's that's entirely my goal what you know um if you could go back right you go back 2013 when you win your world title what advice would you have given yourself now like what would you have done differently if you said you know if you could go back to your younger self what advice would you have given yourself take care of my body and take care of my mind I appreciate your time, Omar Figueroa. It's an absolute pleasure. Like, you know, thank you. Um, you're one. I say this in all seriousness. You're you're one of my favorite fighters of all time. Um, I also want to ask you real quick. Um, you've kind of like I said, you put Rio Grande Valley boxing on the map, but you really put Westaco on the map. Like outside <laughs> of Texas, um, people were like Westaco. Like, where is he from? Yeah. Um, I, I I have a neighbor who's actually from Westlaco, and like all he does is talk about you, you and and Brandon. Um, when I found out I'm a boxing guy, he's like, you, you know the Figueroa. Like, I'm a big fan of the Figueroa's. Does that? I mean, Rio Grande Valley boxing, the city of Westlaco. I mean, do you feel like extra pressure to kind of bring home a win for them because you do mean so much to that community? I mean, obviously, yeah, because I know that there are a lot of kids that look up to us, and yeah, you know, I know that there are a lot of people that that we give them something to cheer about you know aside at the at the world level you know the first i'm the first champion from the valley and especially from westlaco so the fact that my brother and i could both bring that kind of attention to the to the valley and not just the valley but westlaco itself i mean it's a great honor it feels amazing to be able to do that and not everyone has that opportunity so the fact that that i did it and i i did it first and you know it's just I don't think the fans expect much more from me than just for me to for me to take care of myself and for me to to be able to provide just good fights. You know, maybe not another world title or more victories or you know, I don't know what they expect from me. I know they I know they know that, that I can achieve that again. But given what I've gone through and given everything I've been through, I feel like they they just want me to be good. You know, and and I that just make gives me more motivation to want to be even better. Um, and it, it's a pleasure when you do get back to a world title and we know you will get back there. We would love to have a, uh, a homecoming title defense back in, in the Rio Grande Valley. That would be yeah. just about yes, the ultimate. Absolutely. Uh, Omar, it's an honor. It's a privilege getting to talk to you. Uh, tell everyone where they can find you on social media. And if you have any you know, endorsements or anything, any well, sponsors no, I mean, you want to shout out. I just, for, first of all, and, and mainly I want to give a shout out to Simone Biles because if she hadn't pulled out of the Olympics, uh, I would have never cared about my mental health or taken it seriously when I knew it should have. So because of her, I started on this whole journey of, you know, trying to figure myself out and trying to be better, a better version of myself and, you know, starting from the inside out. So the fact that that she did that kind of just 
you know, snowballed into what what's going on now, which I already took care of or well not took care of because it's a men- it's a lifelong struggle. But at least I know what I'm what I'm up against. And now I know why my life had gone in such a direction and why, you know, things didn't work out the way they did. And uh, like I said, just trying to be the best version of myself. And it starts from within. So a huge shout out to Simone Biles. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to the fans that that have stood by me, regardless of, you know, all the crap that I've put them through. And uh, well, yeah, I've just I've just honestly been trying to be the best version of myself. And hopefully we see that that version on July 23rd. Thank you for your time, Champ. I, I really appreciate it. God bless and uh, best of luck July 23rd. And then we'll see you again when you, when you win another world title yes, at 140. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Champ. Yes, sir. Bye-bye.